This copyrighted telecast is an exclusive presentation of Learfield under the broadcasting rights granted by the University of Nevada. Reuse of this presentation is prohibited without the expressed written consent of the University of Nevada and Learfield. Nevada football returns home, aiming to snap a two-game losing streak with Colorado State invading Mackey Stadium. We have highlights plus our exclusive sit down with head coach Jeff Choate. Would you believe it's basketball season? We're going to hear from the Wolfpack's men and women's teams as the silver and blue tips off the 2024-2025 campaign. And after starting her college career far away from home, Mason Navarro has found her way back to the biggest little city. We featured the Bishop Minot grads path to the pack. Well, hello there, friends, and welcome to November's first edition of Wolfpack All Access. I'm your host this week, Mike Stephenson. After taking a tough loss on Oahu, this week the Nevada football team was looking to get right, welcoming a talented Colorado State squad led by an old friend of the program. Former Nevada coach Jay Norvell back in the biggest little city looking to improve to 3-0 and against his former school. And CSU starting things strong. On their opening drive, the Rams are in with former Wolfpack running back Avery Morrow scoring to make it 7-0. After a Nevada punt, CSU back to work. Braden Fowler, Nicolosi up for Caleb Goody. That's a heck of a gain and that's a heck of a fumble forced by Keaton Crawford, but the Rams recover and the drive lives on and CSU will turn it into points using its running back room once again. This time, Justin Marshall scores, and it is 14-0 Colorado State. After another Nevada punt, CSU would drive down and set this up. Jordan Noyes from 60. Would you believe that is a new Mackey Stadium record? It is 17-0. Nevada finally putting a drive together to end the first half. Nine plays, 73 yards, but it ends here on a turnover on downs as the fourth down conversion is no good. Pack trailed 17-0 at the break. First play of the third, Nevada needs momentum and this is the opposite. The pass to Marcus Bellin is good, but the fumble is forced and CSU recovers. The Rams would get three there, but they would get more here. On the ensuing kickoff, nobody from Nevada is there to recover it. And sure enough, the Rams will jump on it in the end zone for a touchdown. Frankly, an inexplicable play as Nevada has a special teams blunder and is down 28 to nothing. So now Nevada really needs to get something going. Brendan Lewis way deep for Cortez Braham Jr. This will be a 57 yard catch and run. He had nine grabs for 141 yards. The pack is in biz and finishing in the end zone with Lewis using his legs. Silver and blue is on the board. It is 28 to seven. Nevada would then put together its best drive of the game. 12 plays, 95 yards. It's another B. Lou rushing score. He rushed for 109 yards, two touchdowns. It's 28-14. Might things get weird in Reno? Avery Morrow said not so fast. Second touchdown for him in his return to Mackey Stadium. That made it 35-14. A bit of a consolation here for Nevada as Jaden Smith makes an epic one-handed touchdown snag but it was too little too late as Colorado State and Jay Norvell leave Mackey Stadium with a 38-21 win. Coming up on Wolfpack All Access presented by Champion Chevrolet, more on this matchup as we hear from the head man. Alex Margulies sits down with Jeff Choate next. put five men on the line of scrimmage on fourth and ten. They're going to come after Lewis. Lewis takes the snap. Here they come. He lofts it left. Lewis for Smith and a one-handed catch in the end zone. Oh my, it's a touchdown for Nevada. All right, coach, uh, Sunday morning here, kind of digesting uh, this game against Colorado State, and, and as you've had a, a night to kind of sleep on it, what, what are kind of your just main thoughts on that yeah, one? Yeah, well, there wasn't a lot of sleep, I can promise you that. Um, you know, I think that the rhythm of the game, the way we had two, really three catastrophic coverage errors early in the game, they capitalized on two, so we kind of spotted them 14. 
and um, settled in, put a good drive together at the end of the first half. Um, I think that I think that if we had it, to, if Brennan had it to do again, I think he would have sh shot the ball out to Sadion. But that was a tough one. The looks that we had gotten consistently in practice this week was, hey, if the backer flies with him, go ahead and tuck it, and, uh, which he tried to do, and they did a good job of overlapping. And uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to convert that fourth down. I think that changes a lot of the dynamic of the game, especially the way the second half started. You know, you look at it, and we turn the ball over. Our defense rises up and forces a turnover, or for forces a, a field goal in a short field, and then you know the inexplicable, just fair catch the ball for the off returner. You know, you don't really. I mean, you're almost making adjustments at that point in time. And you don't really realize what happened. You watch the film, and it, it wasn't a tough one to figure out. It wasn't like it. Sometimes those, you know, they you get a kick that's in between maybe a, a wedge guy and a returner. But that was that was a pretty obvious one. I think we should have made. And so essentially, that was like a that was like a turnover that cost us ten points. 100%. And uh, and you know, then you look at the remainder of the game, and you go, those ten points, pretty pretty com yeah, consequential. Yeah, the game completely. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, you go down twenty eight to nothing like that, and then we settle down and start to put some things together on offense and. Um, probably just didn't have enough at the end on D to, to, to hold up in, on some short fields. And so um, I was proud of the way the guys fought. It's kind of unfortunate part of the process that you got to kind of live through some, some really tough moments. And uh, I think on the back end of it, that uh, we find out a lot about ourselves, man. You know, there's yes. an old, old adage, right, that football doesn't, doesn't build character, it reveals character. And I think that uh, that's, you know, I'm looking for is who are the guys that are the true competitors mm -hmm. that are going to continue to show up and fight. I, I imagine as a coach you have to – in some ways, like, be proud of the way you guys fought because at down 28 nothing, it would have been really easy, the way things have been going, all the injuries, to kind of go, whoa, is me, and, and just kind of roll over. But your team obviously didn't do that. And, again, if you didn't spot them that 10 points, it could have been, hey, a one, one play in this game. To tie yeah, a one-possession game. game, and I think right. we were moving the ball pretty efficiently in the second half. I thought that, you know, um, the combination of Belou's legs, mm -hmm. Sean popping a few runs, and our ability to move the ball consistently through the air uh, was a positive for us. Yeah, you look at, at Lewis, and it just kind of showcased again in this game how dynamic he can be as a playmaker, and you could see it with his legs again. Um, how, how nice was that to have that back and the fact that not only having him there, but then you know, the way that you've been able to kind of mix in Chuba and you even used AJ, and it, you have all these different ways that you can kind of get creative with your play calling to utilize those playmakers to the best of their ability. Yeah, sometimes that's by necessity, you know, and you, we're down some runners, we're down some tight ends, and so... Uh, you got to look around your roster and go, hey, who do we have that maybe we're not utilizing in a, in a conventional role that can help us? And uh, those guys are certainly good players that, that can help us. Defensive coordinator Kane Ione actually coached from the sidelines, which was the first time that you had done that this season, I guess. Why did you make that decision, and, and what did you kind of come away with him being down there on the field? Yeah, well, I think I always like to start with the coordinators in the box. And I think no matter how a game goes – there's always the ability to change the dynamic by bringing them down to the field, sure. and it felt like, uh, you know, after after last week, some of our uh, some of our lack of adjustments that we made. I think that having him closer to the to the action uh, allowed that communication to be cleaner and, and us to make more more consistent adjustments throughout the game. So I thought it was a good change up. All right, so now you have to. Uh, move squarely forward and, and a big challenge this weekend is you go ahead and, uh, to Boise State to take on the Broncos and, and they obviously have uh, one of the most talented players in the country, most talented yeah. runners. Um, I imagine you had a chance to see quite a bit of their film so far this year. I mean, what has been besides uh, the run game? I yeah. mean, what what kind of stands out about them? I think the obvious is to say Ashton Genty is a great player. Yeah. Um, but what great players do is they make other people around them better. And that's what I see on film is I see... Uh, I see, a, um, you know, everybody's got to kind of load up to stop him. Well, you know, their, their receivers are, are getting open more. Their, uh, their quarterback is doing a much better job of running the offense as he gets more and more reps in it. And it all kind of kind of spins around all eyes on Ashton Genty. And then, you know, hey, they've got other playmakers too. And so I think that it's opening up other things in their offense. That was on full display against uh, San, San Diego State on Friday night. Um, defensively, they're a very good football team. I mean, they... Uh, they can play man and do it well. Um, uh, they, they mix their coverages. They've got talented guys up front. So I think they're a complete football team. I'm sure you'll be asked about this a lot this week, but, you know, this game I'm sure is a little bit different for you going back to Boise and, and um, being a head coach as a team, you know, bringing Nevada there. Um, I guess what are your just thoughts as what that's going to be like for you? Yeah, I, it's funny because watching the San Diego State game this morning, um, you know, reminded me a lot of, 
the, um, the the teams that we had there uh, when I when I was an assistant coach. A uh, really good depth, for example, once Genty kind of gets whatever the number is that they've got on him for the day, um, you know, those, those backups come in and they play really, really hard. You know, it's a great program, a lot of history and, of success there. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've been back there before as an assistant coach when I was at the University of Washington, but this will obviously be the first time going there as a head coach. Coach, we appreciate you joining us here on Sunday yeah. and uh, best of luck next week. Awesome. Thank All you. Right. Coming up on Wolfpack All Access, it is time to hoop. We set the table for both Nevada basketball teams next. Fighting through a first quarter concussion, Nevada wide receiver Trevor Inslee made history on November 6, 1999. That concussion kept Inslee on the bench for the second quarter of a 42-33 loss to Idaho, but he returned after halftime to set the NCAA record for career receiving yards previously held by Wyoming's Marcus Harris. Inslee finished that game with 14 catches for 254 yards and two touchdowns. He capped his career with 298 receptions for 5,005 yards and 35 scores. Inslee's receiving yard record was broken by Western Michigan's Corey Davis in 2016, putting the former Nevada star second on the all-time list. But Inslee remains the only FBS wide receiver to post a 2,000-yard season, his 2,060 yards in just 11 games in 1999, remaining college football's single-season standard. Welcome back to Wolfpack All Access presented by Champion Chevrolet. I'm Mike Stephenson. It is that epic time of year when the home stretch of football season intersects with the start of basketball. And there are pretty high expectations for both Wolfpack teams. We'll start with Nevada's men. Coming off back-to-back -back NCAA tournament appearances, but still searching for their first win at the dance under now sixth-year head coach Steve Alford. The Wolfpack picked to finish third in what should be another tightly contested Mountain West Conference with six teams, including Nevada, landing a first-place vote. Standout returner Nick Davidson is part of the preseason all-conference team, while Cal Poly transfer Kobe Sanders was selected as the newcomer of the year. I do like where we're at with seven seniors, and a lot of those seniors are fifth year beyond. Um, so we've got good age, we've got good physicality to us, um, and we've got good experience to us. So hopefully the last two years have prepped us for this upcoming year. We've been picked to finish second and we finished ninth and we've picked, been picked to finish eighth and we've finished third so it's uh, really up to us on where we want to end up at the end of the year. Having this special group again I think really motivates everyone to kind of just lock in and buy into what we want to do and really break that label from being a team that has lost in the postseason to one that can finally make something happen. Nevada opens the season on Monday the 4th, welcoming Sam Houston State to Lawler Event Center. The Wolfpack women have some bulletin board material with Nevada picked to finish 7th in the Mountain West, despite returning its entire starting five and top seven scorers in all from last year's 4th place squad. The Wolfpack also did not have any individual players honored in the preseason, perhaps adding fuel to the fire for 8th year head coach Amanda Levin's veteran group. I feel like every year since I've been here, um, we've been picked pretty, you know, low, and it's our it's our job to go out and finish differently if that's not where we want to finish. But also, um, I think with the players that we have returning and the players that we've added, um, I think seventh for us is not something we're gonna that we believe in. I personally don't really ever look at that stuff, um, just because it's it's hard to do that to any team. I mean, people get hurt, people get in foul trouble. Like, a team is never the same every single day, and so I think it's very hard to just like, confine them and put them in a box and put them on a list, honestly. So I think we just gotta go out, we gotta play every single day and prove something. Nevada actually opened its schedule with an exhibition October 30th against Cal State Stanislaus, the Warriors, proving to be no issue with the Wolfpack winning 73 to 45. The Silver and Blue starts its regular season Wednesday the 6th at Oregon. And Nevada Sportsnet is proud to announce this season we will be airing at least 25 games between both squads, including the men's season opener. You can see our full schedule at NevadaSportsNet.com. Coming up on Wolfpack All Access, the route Reno local Mason Navarro took to joining Nevada Volleyball and the important reunion that came with it. 
Her story is next. I'm Caleb Ramsey of the Nevada football team, and I'll be answering five questions. Favorite football memory is beating Folsom in my senior year of high school in the third round of the playoffs to go back to the section championship. Maybe some shoes, maybe some shoes, or no, Xbox, Xbox. Favorite Xbox game is Blitz the League. I played with, I made my own team actually, because I did the campaign and I made my own team and I forgot what my team name was, but we were pretty good. I would say right now, Saquon Barkley, um, and all time, Barry Sanders. Best football movie, hands down, has to be, there's a tie actually, Friday Night Lights and, and The Longest Shard. Wolfpack All Access presented by Champion Chevrolet rolls on. I'm your host, Mike Stephenson. It is always great when a local product is featured within any Nevada athletics program, especially because their journeys to rocking silver and blue are often very different. Mason Navarro is no exception. Shannon Kelly shows us why the Bishop Minot graduates return to Reno means a whole lot. Mason Navarro's volleyball journey is back where it started. I feel like it was just like a meant to be moment, like something that doesn't happen so often and it was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. After spending one season at Eastern Illinois, the Bishop Minot product returned to Reno, reuniting with assistant Jason Sterrett on the Wolfpack her former Bishop Minogue and club team coach since she was nine. The first time I ever met, I wore pink spandex in the NNJ volleyball gym and I got yelled at. And I've never worn pink spandex again. We're pretty adamant that we have the same uniforms and all those types of things. I just told her those aren't acceptable here and, and we kind of had a bantering relationship ever since. A relationship that dug much deeper during Navarro's sophomore year at Minogue when her father, Desi, passed away after a quick battle with stomach cancer. I actually had went to him the day after my dad had passed away and I told him I was probably not gonna play volleyball. He didn't say anything because I think he knew I wasn't gonna be done, but he gave me a hug and he just told me that he got me. I think she would come back to realize uh, what volleyball means to her and what it meant to her and her father's relationship. So I was always pretty confident she was gonna come back. From then on, he's been my rock. If I need anything, if literally anything in the world I can go to him for. Mason has a great support system and she's had a lot of people around her, but I just kind of was behind the scenes trying to make sure that I picked up any pieces that were left. Trading in green and gold for silver and blue, Navarro says she's thankful for the opportunity to play for the Wolfpack and her former coach. Best coach, best human, and I'm just thankful to have such a great figure in my life that has helped me grow to become the person I am today and continues to help me grow on and off the court. Mason has really grown up. She's uh, working hard to honor her father's memory. She's working hard to honor her mother who has really been the backbone of uh, the last few years in, in, in helping her and she's walking the walk and I'm very proud of her. Navarro's family is at every home game including her late father, whose presence she always keeps close by. I think about him all the time, like he's my dad always through and through. Um, but I do wear this bracelet every game, I don't know. It says, he always used to text me, work hard, have fun, and don't suck. The bracelet just reminds me like every day that he's here. Like I feel him, like this is my thing for him. For Wolfpack All Access, I'm Shannon Kelly. Thank you, Shannon. This week, the ladies fell twice via three set sweeps. First Tuesday on the road at Utah State and then back home Saturday against Boise State. Coming up, Nevada soccer hits the pitch at the Mountain West Tournament. Those results next on Wolfpack All Access. Back here on Wolfpack All Access, presented by Champion Chevrolet. After a slow start to conference play, Nevada soccer rallying to reach the Mountain West Conference Tournament in thrilling fashion. Nevada doing so by winning at UNLV for the first time in program history, snapping a 10-game losing streak in Las Vegas. Senior Trinity Sandridge providing the game-deciding goal, scoring on a penalty kick in the 81st minute. 
the win, sending the silver and blue to San Diego as the sixth and final seed at the conference tourney. That set up a Sunday match with Colorado State, a duel going to the Rams. Nevada finishes the season 6, 13, and 2 in the second campaign under Vanessa Valentine. All right, that is it for this week's edition of Wolfpack All Access presented by Champion Chevrolet. But don't forget to catch our daily coverage of Nevada and a whole lot more on NSN Tonight. That's weeknights at 6, 8, and 10 on Nevada Sportsnet and again at 1030 over on Fox 11. Until next time, I'm Mike Stephenson saying so long, friends. This has been an exclusive presentation from Learfield.